Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. good. All right, good. I'm doing good too. <laughs> good to see you all this morning. Uh, my name is Lance. If you're a guest with us, my name is Lance. I'm the pastor here at the church. Glad to have you all with us. Or maybe if you're joining us online this morning, welcome again. A um, couple of things to do before we get started this morning. I I have, Corey, what are you doing? Uh, picking up boxes? <laughs> you have to do that now. Oh. Yeah. I'm in the middle of stuff. Uh, well, I kind of forgot where I was supposed to put them this morning, and then I got sidetracked with uh, worship practice, and then it just hit me. I was supposed to put them in the fellowship uh, storage closet, and I didn't want to trip on them because I'm clumsy, and I didn't want the worship team to trip on them. <laughs> Is he serious right now? <laughs> So, okay, what are all these boxes for? I have to ask. What are they for? Um, they're for uh, VBS this summer. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're doing a Lego theme, VBS, uh, about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, and well, we're going to need a lot more boxes. <laughs> Oh, boy. Okay. I got an idea. So you need some boxes for VBS mm -hmm. to build stuff, a Lego theme, yes. Nehemiah rebuilding the wall. Okay, I got an idea. Uh -huh. What if we could get more people than just you to pick up boxes? Maybe not on Sunday morning like right now. <laughs> Maybe this isn't the best time. But what if we could get everyone involved to bring a box in, no matter what size it is, no matter what shape, bring a box in so that we could have lots of boxes for VBS? That would be a great idea. Let's do it. Oh, all <laughs> well, right. I got I to gotta get these boxes so you can do your, your stuff. I, I would appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Yeah. I said I was clumsy. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. But pay no attention to the man um, behind the curtain. I, pay no attention to the man. Okay. Okay, well, there you have it, folks. Save that date for VBS. That is July 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. There in the middle of July, we will have our vacation Bible school, our annual vacation Bible school. It is Lego theme, so we need lots of boxes to build stuff, okay? So if you get new shoes... If you get something in the mail from Amazon, save those boxes. Anything that's bigger than, we'll say, something like this. Anything bigger than this, save those boxes, and we will find a way to put them to good use. Good idea? Bring them in to us, and we'll figure out a place to put them, too. And hopefully we have a lot. Okay, there you go. All right, let me continue now, now that I don't have my distraction. If you are a guest with us this morning, I have this card right here in front of me. It is a welcome card. This is also found in front of you, in the chair in front of you. So if it's maybe your first or second, or maybe your third time here and you've never filled one of these out, would you be so kind as to pick one of these up in the chair in front of you, fill it out front, side, and back? That way we can have a record of your attendance with us and then just drop it in the offering plate as that goes by a little bit later in the service. And then also... If you're relatively new with us, a guest, as a welcome, we have our, our welcome center desk that's right outside in the foyer there, and that's got some books and different literature on it. You're welcome to pick one of those up and keep it. Take it home. Um, if you don't tell anybody, I'll let you take two, okay? But that'll just be, be between me and you. you. You can have a couple of those if you would like, but some books out there is a way to say thanks for coming today and hope you enjoy those. So a couple of other things I want to mention <clears throat> for uh, announcements, and then we'll have prayer as well. Um, 
The youth are not with us today. They are on a youth trip. So we're missing a few families and then uh, the youth. And they left Friday afternoon and they should be back sometime this afternoon. And uh, we're praying that they had a really good time or having a really good time. Pray that they'll come back safely and um, that the Lord would stir and work in their hearts. That They have a number of things planned as far as activities that are kind of common, right, that you would think of. There's some times where they would serve and rotate and do different things for each other um, while they're staying together. And then they're going on walks and hikes and do activities. And then, of course, lessons and things like that, too. So just pray that that all goes really well. Um, I have here a little tiny, um, little tiny card. You can't see it very well, but this is actually for the Gideons. It's called Conversations. Our local Gideons are putting on uh, what we would say is like an evangelism seminar. If you are interested in learning how or being refreshed or being challenged or encouraged for how to share your faith through simple conversations, the Gideon teaches this. And so if you're familiar with uh, Pleasant View Church or Jeff Malay, I'm really good friends with Jeff Malay and Pleasant View in the Wren area. Um, he's a, they're putting it on. It'll be in a couple of Saturdays, but then um, they've invited anybody from our church they want to go. And I already know that a handful of people have signed up for that. This is the last chance to sign up. If you've been thinking about it and just haven't done it yet, there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer at that Welcome Center desk. If you would sign up, that way they can know how many people are coming from our church. And so, again, there's already been a handful of people, and if you would like to do that, please do so today, okay? And then I will let them know how many people are coming. And I would actually go to that, except I'm going to be on vacation. Uh, otherwise, I would love to be at that. And with that note, you'll see that in the bulletin, I'm headed on vacation for a couple of weeks. Tiberius Ratza has been so kind to be able to come and preach the next couple of Sundays on that Sunday, last Sunday in April, there'll be a big potluck. And so again, not that you have to sign up to come, but it does help us know how much food to prepare. So if you plan on staying around that Sunday after church, then please sign up in the foyer so that we can prepare that and know how many tables to set up and how much food to make. And it is a potluck. So bring something to share as well. And, um, I think the last thing I want to mention is one more time to talk about the idea of the music coordinator, right? The quote-unquote music coordinator. Um, let me make sure this is clear. I mentioned it last Sunday too. We're not talking about changing, drastically changing the music style of what we're doing because I know when we say worship leader, that's the thought in people's minds. That's not the idea. We enjoy the music we have. We just want to try to be able to incorporate people more, get a little bit um, better in the background with organization so things are better and, and it takes pressure off of everyone up here who does a great job, but working hard to do that, um, it is a lot of work and there's a lot of work that goes on in the background that people don't see when they, they just stand up here Sunday morning and then we do our worship service. There's a lot that goes on there. So um, Eric is the gentleman's name. He'll be here and the plan is then for Eric to come and be with us and kind of start in an official capacity on May 5th. So that first Sunday in May, and we're really excited about it. Um, he and his wife, they're excited about coming to the church. He's from the area, from the Lincoln View area. I've known Eric for uh, many years in this way and um, in this area. And so it, it's not, um, not someone... Uh, like out of the blue or something. It's people that uh, several of you know. I've even heard that um, as I've talked to a number of you in the church here. So just wanted to mention that. Um, you know what? And I think that's it. So I am going to read the Bible verse out of the bulletin this morning. And if you're looking at that, you can follow along here. And it is from Hebrews 4.14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Amen? Jesus Christ is our great high priest, so let us hold fast to our faith, okay? 
Let's do this. Will you stand with me? I will open up in a word of prayer and we'll get started with our musical worship this morning. Stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful that we can gather together this morning. We are thankful that Jesus is our high priest and that he has made a way for us to be reconciled with the Father. Thank you that Jesus has paved the way and thank you that he intercedes for us and he is, uh, he is helping us live out our faith. Thank you that Jesus died for our sins and we get to worship him now. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be set on Jesus and things above. And we pray that, in a sense, you would quiet our hearts and allow us to focus on Jesus no matter what we have on our minds this morning, no matter what's going on around the rest of the world. Help us to be in one accord, in one spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Page 630, if you'd like to follow along, what a friend we have in Jesus.
Gentlemen, you can go ahead and get ready at this time. In just a moment, we'll collect our morning offering. So a couple of things that we can pray for. Uh, I mentioned the youth um, have gone away for the weekend. They're on a trip. We'll pray for them, that they're having a good time, that God stirs and works in their hearts. Uh, also, Barb Merkel passed away uh, a couple of days ago. Um, Barb, as I mentioned last Sunday, was just a, a dear, dear lady. Um, got along really well with her. Uh, she had such a sweet spirit. She loved the church. Uh, she loved to pray for this church. And, um, of course, we miss her, but we know where she is uh, because we have a, a sure and certain hope in Jesus Christ, right? That because he was raised from the dead, that we too will be raised from the dead. And we will see her again one day. Um, and then, of course, I, I don't know if any of you were paying attention last night in the, the evening as it got towards evening. But on the other side of the world, um, there was a, an attack on Israel. And so a lot of... Um, a lot of missiles, I don't know, bombs, but missiles were sent their way. And uh, thankfully, they were able to knock down, I heard, 99% of those. And um, things are going okay as far as their defense. But uh, it's, I mean, wars, right? Wars and rumors of wars and um, this crazy world we live in. And it's a reminder to us all that while we put our hope in Jesus, that this world is not all there is. And I'm sure thankful for that. I hope you guys are as well, <laughs> that, um, that there is an eternal glory that is waiting for us. And uh, we're waiting on Jesus to return and bring that to us. So we pray for peace, um, pray for peace around the world. Uh, more importantly, we're praying for peace in the hearts of people all around the world, that they would know Jesus and they would know that no matter what happens, that Jesus is in control and he's coming back again. Uh, so let's go ahead and bow our heads. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, we are thankful for Jesus and that you sent him and that he is our high priest. Thank you that because he made the offering, he made the sacrifice, and it was once and for all and done that our sins are washed away and we are forever forgiven. Thank you that we can stand firm, that we can boldly come to the throne of grace, knowing that we stand before you, Father, and the throne above, not in and of ourselves, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've done in your wonderful and masterful plan to bring us salvation and to redeem us. And we praise you for that. We know that we are so unworthy in anything that we do in and of ourselves. We are so unworthy, but yet you have saw fit in your infinite wisdom to love us and send Jesus Christ for us. Thank you, Lord, that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We pray for uh, the Merkel family and just ask that you would comfort them in the passing of Barb at this time. Pray that they would be reminded of a, of a mother, uh, uh, maybe a mother-in-law, maybe an aunt, uh, a grandmother, that they would be reminded of Barb's faithfulness and love for Jesus. And that would stir them on towards love and good deeds. Uh, pray that they may cherish the time that they've had together on this earth and they would look forward to the day when they get to see her again in glory. And uh, we pray for Israel and pray for peace and um, just pray uh, for the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, pray that Jesus would return for us and he would come quickly. He would come soon and he would set all things right. Pray that when he comes, we would be found ready, waiting and watching. That we would be found working, uh, working for Jesus' glory and living faithfully and steadfast and walking with Jesus in righteousness and holiness. And so that when Jesus comes, so we would hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, help us to be faithful to the very end in all that we do. Thank you for Grace Bible Church and thank you that we are able to worship um, without the fear of 
having missiles come our way. Thank you that we are able to preach the Bible. Thank you that we are able to gather and fellowship, that we are able to sing and give praise. May our hearts be touched this morning, and may we be encouraged to go out this week and live out our faith for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. touched me. Thank you, Ilona. Um, this next song we're going to do, we've done it several times in the past, but this is a little bit different arrangement, uh, a little bit different tune. You'll find it in the hymn book. I want you to stand and join us at page 352. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
power of the cross. Thank you for your very wonderful singing this morning, and um, I would invite you now to open your Bible with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and Deuteronomy chapter 18 is where we'll be, starting in verse 1. Before we get there, though, I mean, you can turn there, but I want to read a couple of Bible verses, not from Deuteronomy 18. They'll be on the screen behind me here, and I'll start with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Out of the NIV, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest 
who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. And there you see a verse that talks about Jesus being a great high priest. And then a second verse, John 14, uh, John 4, 19, this would be the story of the woman at the well when Jesus approaches her and says, woman, if you know who it was, it speaks to you. So the woman says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I perceive that you are a prophet. Now stop right there for a moment, okay? Last Sunday, we talked about Jesus Christ being the judge and the king. Not just the judge and not just the king, but the ultimate or the perfect judge. And the ultimate or the perfect king. And I said last Sunday that it was kind of like if we were going on a trip to Miami. And I put this map up here. Remember, if we were going to start from Van Wert, Ohio and head all the way down to Miami. That's what it would look like. It's almost 1,300 miles. If you were able to um, drive straight through, hold on tight and drive straight through the whole way, it'd take you a little over 17 hours. I'm not sure many of us could do that though. But there you go. Um, There is an alternate route. Again, if you would look at that. But remember I said last week that as we look in the Old Testament from Deuteronomy, we were looking at chapter 16 in the middle there of chapter 16. And we were looking at through chapter 18, verse 22. And that that chapter and two and a half chapters of Deuteronomy that we're looking at are all one section. And they describe four different offices in the Old Testament. The first two that we looked at last Sunday were the judge and the king. And I tried to tell you last Sunday that it was kind of like this, like this map that we have right here that we're looking at. If I said to you, let's go to Miami, and we started in Van Wert, we jumped in our cars, we started driving, we would see no signs anywhere that said Miami this way. We just have to head a certain direction, right? And actually it'd be this way. Am I right about that? Sometimes I get up here and I get confused about which way is which. But we would head in a certain direction. And then as we traveled further and further, almost 1,300 miles, the closer we got to our destination, the more signs we would see, right? So while we're all the way, now let's apply this to Deuteronomy. While we're all the way back in Deuteronomy, we're not going to see signs about Jesus, We're not going to see the name of Jesus. We're not going to see the Messiah anywhere. We're not going to see the name Christ anywhere, anything like that. But as we trace these thoughts about the judge and the king and today, the priest and the prophet, as we trace these thoughts throughout the the Old Testament and into the New Testament, we wind up at a destination, which is like winding up at Miami. The closer we get, the more signs we see. So you may get 100 miles away and you may see a sign that says, Miami, 100 miles away, right? It's clear. And then as you uh, approach Miami, you may see a sign that says, Miami, right? Like if you were driving in Van Wert, you would see a sign that says, Van Wert, town or or Van Wert city, right? You see those signs along the road. Well, it's the same way. So if we start here in Deuteronomy and we walk down a road and we are going to try to start in Van Wert and wind up in Miami, it may be a little fuzzy what Miami looks like. But what about this? I found this picture on the internet. What about this? Isn't that just a beautiful picture of Miami? Uh, There, it looks like it's at dusk and all the lights are lit up and I don't know, maybe there's a little Photoshop going on there to enhance it a little bit, but that's just a beautiful picture of Miami. And I would like to make a parallel with that, that just like you're looking at this, we're going to apply that to the Bible and say, okay, we're going to start here, and we, we don't know much other than we're headed in a direction, but as we get this way, our destination is Jesus Christ, and when we finally arrive and get to see Jesus as the high priest that's written back in Deuteronomy, as the prophet written back in Deuteronomy, we get to see Jesus in all of this glory and majesty. 
So that's where we want to end up today or this morning as we take a look at this, okay? But now let me bring this over specifically to our message because here's the big idea. Very similar to last Sunday. If you walk out with anything, this is what I would want you to learn and remember this morning. It would be this right here. That Jesus Christ is the perfect priest and prophet. Last Sunday, that Jesus is the perfect judge and king, right? Jesus is the perfect judge and king, and today, Jesus is the perfect priest and prophet. Okay, now what do you mean by that, pastor? Right? Okay, well, let's take a look. All right, let's go back to our Bibles. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to read this section here, 1 through 8. Follow along, please. Verse 1, the Levitical priests, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance, as he promised them. And this shall be the priests due from the people. From those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. Now pause there and that yum, yum, right? That sounds good. Okay, we'll go on a little bit further. Verse four, you should also get here the first fruits of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep. You shall give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. Verse 6, and if a Levite comes from any of your towns out of all Israel where he lives and he may come when he desires to the place that the Lord will choose and ministers in the name of the Lord his God, like all his fellow Levites who stand to minister there before the Lord, then he may have equal portions to eat besides what he receives from the sale of his patrimony. Okay, pause there for a moment. Whew. Some of you may be thinking, wow, that's why I struggle to read Deuteronomy, right? <laughs> that's tough, isn't it? Now, let me ask again, did any of you see the name of Jesus in that passage? No. Did you see Messiah written in that passage? No, it wasn't there either, right? And of course, we didn't see Christ because that's New Testament, but this is Old Testament. But we're going to get somewhere, okay? Let's start as we always do with what it means for the people back here in the Old Testament, and we'll move this way towards our destination, which is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Okay, so as we look at this in the Bible here, let's go back to the passage, and we see starting in verse 1, the Levitical priests and all the tribe of Levi, they shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. Now let's pause for a moment. What does that mean? Well, if you remember, Jacob had 12 sons. I couldn't name them off the top of my head. How many of you could? Good. I'm in good company, right? <laughs> But we know that Levi was one of the 12. Levi was one of Jacob's 12 sons. There was Gad and Manasseh and Simeon and, right? There, I mean, some of those names ring a bell, right? Judah was another. Um, maybe I could get a few of them if I thought about it. But as we're looking at it, Levi was one of the 12 sons. And it says here that the, the Lord has chosen Levi. Uh, we know that the Lord has chosen Levi to be the Levitical priests or the priesthood in Israel. And because they're the priesthood, they don't get any of the portion of the land. Now, what does that mean? Let's back up a little bit, okay? All the way, this is Deuteronomy, by the way. Over here is Moses, okay? That's why I'm here right now. I'm, I'm in this time frame, okay? So now the Israelites have left Egypt They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They're about done. And Deuteronomy is a book of Moses standing on the precipice looking into the promised land. The whole book is Moses standing there talking to the people about what's going to happen when they go into the promised land. 
And when they go into the promised land, they are supposed to divide up the land among the 12 tribes. Except Levi doesn't get any portion of the land. So it's only divided 11 ways. No, it's divided 12 ways with, um, I believe it's, uh, you know what, I forget off the top of my head. So we'll just leave that. Does anybody know? Joseph's sons were... Yeah, Ephraim. There you go. It was Ephraim, right? Or Ephraim. Yeah, that's, that's the 12th one that takes the place of Levi. Thank you. Sometimes I think on the spot and I have no idea what I'm talking about. And then I do things like this. But uh, okay, so now you, that's the covering the 12 tribes, right? Levi doesn't get a portion. And the reason is because they are supposed to be the religious leaders in the land. And then it says here... That in verse 1, they shall eat the Lord's offering as their inheritance. Instead of getting land as their inheritance, they're supposed to eat the Lord's offering. Verse 2, they shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance. Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, what it doesn't mean is that the Levites have to live in poverty. It doesn't mean they're supposed to be poor people of the land and they don't get anything at all. But what it means is that when, uh, let's say you and I are the rest of the tribe of Israel, every time we're supposed to bring an offering to the Lord, um, and we'll pretend that there's a temple. In Moses' day, Deuteronomy, there wasn't yet, but let's just pretend for the sake of language that there's a temple. We bring an offering to the temple, the offering is made, and then the food that was there is given to the priests or the Levites to eat. And that is their inheritance. That's how they are supported. Literally, that's how they eat, is by the offerings of the people. That's what it means. It doesn't mean they're supposed to be poor or impoverished. The Lord is their inheritance. So, the priest. What is the role of the priest in the Old Testament? It's a good question, isn't it? It would really help us understand that. The role of the priest in the Old Testament, if I could say it as simply as I can, it would be to represent man to God. The role of the priest is to represent man to God. If I extrapolated it a little bit, I would say that the role of the priest is to mediate between God and men. So if I'm a priest at the temple and you're an Israelite in the Old Testament, and you are to come because God says everybody's a sinner, and you're to come and give offerings and sacrifices for your sin. You come to the temple, and then I take your lamb or your calf or your offering, a grain offering. I can take that animal. I would sacrifice it. I would mediate. I would do the work of making a sacrifice killing that animal, offering it on the altar, and that way between you and God, there is someone in between because you can't stand in God's presence, right? Nobody can. None of us can. We can't stand in God's presence. So there has to be someone in the middle in order to filter things like sin generally and holiness specifically, right? Those two don't match sin and holiness and there needs to be like a filter in the middle and that's the priest. They were to mediate or to be like a, a, a representative for man to God to say, okay, here are sinful people. God, I'm making this sacrifice on the altar. God, I'm doing this on behalf of the people so that you will not judge them or punish them. So your sins are forgiven. So do you know who the first priest was mentioned in the Bible? Mentioned. Do you know who the first priest was? Melchizedek. You get an A for the day, Miss Marfa. You get an A. Melchizedek, all the way back in Genesis, I think it's 14. Abraham was traveling around. He went to war. He was traveling, and he met Melchizedek, the first mention of a priest. The mention of a priest in the Old Testament was Melchizedek. Do you know who the first high priest was mentioned in the Bible? That would be Aaron. 
Aaron, yes, you guys get an A for the day as well. Aaron, that's Moses' brother, Aaron, is the first high priest mentioned in the Bible. And so in God's grace, knowing that everyone is a sinner, we know those Israelites are, right? They're big time sinners. (laughs) But knowing everyone is a sinner in God's grace, he established Levites to be the mediators between men and God. Okay, so if you'll keep your finger in Deuteronomy 18 with me just for a moment and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. I want to show you this, okay, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, and we'll look in verse 8. Keep your finger there in Deuteronomy 18 and look in Deuteronomy 10, verse 8. And it says here, at that time... The Lord set apart the tribe of, say it with me now, Levi. Set apart the tribe of Levi. And there were three tasks that are mentioned in this verse. Three tasks. Number one, they were to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That's one task of the Levites, to carry the ark of the covenant. Task number two is to stand before the Lord to minister to him. And that's what we just talked about, the making the sacrifices at the temple. They're a mediator, right? To stand before the Lord to minister to him. And number three, to bless his name, to bless the name of the Lord. Those, okay, you can go back to Deuteronomy 18, but those are the tasks of the Levites according to Deuteronomy 10 verse 8. So the priesthood in the Old Testament was instituted by God after the Israelites left Egypt, after the Exodus, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi for special service. Now, I understand that if you do research, you're going to find sort of Um, sort of not every scholar agrees on this, but I'm going to give you the basics, understanding there's a lot more to it, and maybe you'll do some research and find out, well, I'm not sure about this, but here's the basics. So you have the whole tribe of Levi, but even within the tribe of Levi, they were divided into two groups. There were, uh, uh, this is basic, okay, I know there's a lot more that goes into it, but there were, even within the tribe of Levi, there were two groups One group were those that were called the priests. And they were the ones who actually served at the temple and they were specifically descendants of Aaron. And so there is the belief or or the assumption that that the priests in the Old Testament, you could only be a priest even though you were from the tribe of Levi, down the family tree there was Aaron and you could only be a priest if you were descended from Aaron. Well, then that begs the question, what about everybody else in the tribe of Levi, right? Well, everybody else was also a Levite, but then you have the distinction in roles where the priests served at the temple and their job was to make the sacrifices, to be the mediators and go between one another. We also know from Deuteronomy 17, in that passage we skipped last Sunday just for the sake of time, in 17 verses 8 to 13, that the priests were supposed to be, fill a role of judges as well. They were supposed to help judge. But then they were also supposed to be teachers of the law. Okay, that's the priests, and that was a very specific group. Now, all of the Levites, they had another function, and we just read a couple of those from Deuteronomy 10, where they were supposed to do other things than make sacrifices. They were supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. It says that they lived spread out. Not everybody lived in Jerusalem at the temple. That was the priests. But there were other Levites that were spread out all across the promised land. And their role would be a a general role of encouragement and, and function in the nation of Israel to encourage the people and even sometimes teach or edify the people from the law. But they didn't go to the temple and make sacrifices. So there was a little bit of a difference there. And let me say for, I think, the, at least the third or maybe the fourth time, there's a lot more that goes into it, but that's the basics of it, okay? So, out of this, uh, are you guys still with me? 
Yeah? Okay. All right. I know this is a lot. I said we're going to start here, but we're going to move a little bit further, okay? I'm almost done with this part right here. Out of all of this came the high priest. You had the Levites who were like the religious leaders in the land and uh, from the tribe of Levi. And then down the family tree, you had Aaron and Moses were brothers. And Aaron was the first high priest. And then his family line became the priests that made sacrifices at the temple. And then even from there, you had the high priest. Only a descendant of Aaron could be the high priest, which makes sense, right? Right? Makes sense. Only the descendant of Aaron could be a high priest. And the job of the high priest was a, he had uh, many jobs, but probably his most famous or notable was to make the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement every year. The Day of Atonement. So the priests in general would be at the temple. And I've described it this way many times before. Just imagine um, when I was in young uh, elementary school, my teacher would say, put your thinking caps on. Put your thinking caps on with me and let's pretend for a second that we're at the temple in the Old Testament and you've got the court of the Gentiles and then you've got the place where the Jews can come, the Jewish men, and then you've got inside it, let's pretend that back here is the Holy of Holies, but right up here is the holy place. And it would be behind a, a curtain or behind walls. And you guys can't, you normal Jews or Israelites, you can't come here. Only the priests can do that. And they would come in here and make offerings. The altar of incense would be here. And they would make an, an offering twice a day, morning and evening. But then once a year on the Day of Atonement, they would have a sacrificial lamb and it would be representative of the sins of the people and the high priest and only the high priest and only once a year, he would sacrifice that animal and then he would take a hyssop branch and get some blood on it, walk it into the Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. And the New Testament, we find that this is where the veil is when Jesus died and the veil was torn from top to bottom like this. This is the holy place. The high priest would walk in and he would sprinkle blood from that hyssop onto the Ark of the Covenant and it was symbolic of covering the sins of the people and himself, but covering the sins of the people. That was his job, his main job or what he's most famous for. And so understanding all of this, okay, Let's catch our breath for a moment, right? Whew. That's a lot. Is that a lot? But you got it all, right? I, I didn't see anybody say right. Uh, one. <laughs> Two. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for following along. Okay, I know it's a lot. Okay, but now we go and let's travel. Let's take the leap and find Jesus Christ in all of this. Because it's not mentioned here. And even what I just gave you, the rundown, is a lot more than is mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. But as we understand this, understanding the, high, the role of the high priest, I hope we can better understand the significance of Jesus Christ as the high priest. So let's read a couple of Bible verses. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy 18, and let's turn to Hebrews, okay? And we'll read some Bible verses there. Let's start in Hebrews chapter 7. If you stay in Deuteronomy 18 and turn to Hebrews chapter 7, all the way back there in the New Testament near the end, Hebrews chapter 7 and I am going to read, make sure I got my Bible marked at Deuteronomy 18 so I can find it quickly. And we'll go back there in just a moment. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, let's read this verse. Follow along as I read it. Verse 27, it says, He has no need, this is Jesus, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since 
He did this once for all when he offered him up himself. Now pause right there. Now hopefully we get a better understanding of Jesus Christ as the high priest. That year after year, the priest would come, uh, they would be in the temple making sacrifices day after day, year after year, the high priest would come in. But when Jesus came, there's no longer a need. Okay, let's flip to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 24. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. See that mediation there of the priest? Okay, verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. Verse 26. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Wow. Jesus is the ultimate, the perfect high priest. Let's see. I have one more here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies shall be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now let's stop right there and let me make a few comments about Jesus as our high priest. Jesus filled that role that's all the way back here that he's not mentioned, but as we trace it back, if we were to look at hundreds and hundreds of years of history, you see this being crammed into the minds of the Israelite people that there had to be a high priest, there had to be sacrifices, there had to be mediation between God and men. And you see Jesus come and fill that role perfectly He made the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. And he did it once and for all. And it's done. And so there are a couple of things that we can learn here, dear friends. A couple of things. In the Old Testament, there was a little bit of trepidation when you went to the temple and had the priest make make a sacrifice for your sins. But in the New Testament, we're told to come boldly to the throne knowing that Jesus made the sacrifice for our sins. If Jesus made the sacrifice for our sins once and for all, what does it mean about our sins? Does it mean, uh, let, let me try to say it this way. If Satan comes to accuse you of a sin, and we've all got them, don't we? How many skeletons do you have in the closet? One? Two, boy, that would be nice, wouldn't it? How many sins do we have hidden from everyone else? And Satan comes to us and he wants to accuse us and say, I know what you did there. What do we say? What should be our response in that moment? Well, not that there's magic words or incantations, but something along these lines. Hey, Satan, Jesus paid for that. Not repeatedly, right? Not repeatedly, but once and for all. Oh my goodness, folks, I have goosebumps. I wish you could see them. Once and for all, our sins have been paid for. And they cannot come back. Romans 8 would tell us that if God is for us, who can be against us? If Satan tries to accuse us, he cannot because Satan cannot outmatch God. He does not outrank God. 
If God says our sins are forgiven, then our sins are forgiven. No matter what we feel like, no matter what we've done, no matter what people say, our sins are forgiven because we have a great high priest who made a sacrifice once. In the Old Testament, they did it repeatedly, but not Jesus Christ. He did it once and for all time. Praise Jesus Christ. And so we should remember who our great high priest is. We should remember whom we follow, right? Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, the son of David, who made a sacrifice for our sins. And because of him, we are free. And if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Oh my goodness, folks. Jesus is our great high priest. I, I need to move on. I have waste, not wasted. Uh, I have used a lot of time on that subject. Israel's priests, number one, Israel's priests were to teach and make sacrifices which point to Christ, the ultimate priest, right? Israel's priests were to teach and make sacrifices which points to Christ, the ultimate priest. Amen and amen. Okay, number two, Israel's prophets were to confront and challenge, which points to Christ, the ultimate prophet. Israel's prophets were to confront and challenge, which points to Christ, the ultimate prophet. Okay, now let's look at our Bibles. Uh, back in Deuteronomy 18, let's look in verse 9 at the passage here. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abom abominable practice of those nations. Um, some translations say detestable. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his sons or his daughter as an offering. Now let me pause. I would hope that's just common sense to all of us, right? But in the Old Testament, remember as we've been going through Deuteronomy for like months and months, remember in those early chapters when we studied the passage, a couple of passages where God told the Israelites to go into the land and just kill everybody? All of those pagan people in the land, kill them all. Uh, man, woman, child, even their animals, and then burn all their possessions. And we looked at that, and I tried to an ask the question and answer the question because it's asked all the time, doesn't that seem harsh? Like, how could a good, loving God declare genocide upon a people? Well, here you get one of the answers for why that's true. Uh, um, not to go into it, but... First of all, let, let's understand there are no innocent people. Everyone is a sinner. But here you have one of the things that the people do that is detestable that are in the land right now, the pagan people that are in the land, and Israel's going to come in, and God says, when you go in, I don't want you to do any of these things. They are detestable. They are an abomination. Okay. And one of them would be child sacrifice. But then we go on. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortune, fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. Verse 12, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for, the, for these nations which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. So right away, before we get to the idea of a prophet, we see this understanding that there's a lot of sin in the land, and when the people go in, God doesn't want them to follow the patterns and practices of worship like this, okay? All right, now let's go on a little bit further. Verse 15, 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Pause right there for a moment. Instead of going into the land and finding sorcerers and diviners and necromancers and offering child sacrifices, this is how the pagan people tried to find the will of God. We'll say gods, foreign gods, non-gods. This is how the people tried to find how to live, uh, like the will of God for their life. And God says, instead of doing that, look to the prophet. Look to the prophet. Okay, all right, let's go on a little further. So verse 16. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. They were scared. Verse 17. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak that he shall speak in my name I myself will require it of him but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods that same prophet shall die and if you say in your heart how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken well, here's the answer. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Okay, now let's talk about this just for a few moments. In the, the Bible, the first priest that was mentioned was Melchizedek. Do you know who the first prophet was? A little trivia for you. Oh, you have to go back quite a ways. Who was the first prophet mentioned in the Bible? It was Abraham. It really was. Abraham was called a prophet in the Old Testament. Okay, so now you have here a passage about prophets. And it says specifically, a prophet like me, Moses, a prophet who is to come. And there are a couple of key elements about a true prophet. Did you catch those in verse 16 and following there? What makes a true prophet? Well, number one, uh, God will raise him up. A true prophet is raised up by God. That's in verse 15 and 18. A true prophet is raised up by God. A second key element of a true prophet is that a true prophet will speak God's message. A true prophet does not speak on his own. A true prophet speaks what God wants him to speak. And we find this in the Old Testament repeatedly said where the prophets come and say, Thus saith the Lord, right? They are speaking the very words of God. Okay, and then a, a third element about a true prophet is that a true prophet carries the authority of God himself. And so to reject a prophet is to reject God himself. All right, their primary job was to challenge the people with God's word. In this section of Deuteronomy, you have, you have the judges and the king, and then the prophet, uh, I'm sorry, the priest, and then the prophet. The prophet comes last for a reason. Because the judge and the king and the priest were all to, in different roles, were all to uphold the laws and commands of God. And if they ever got off track, which we know they did, then the prophet would come along and say, hey, you guys have abandoned the commands of God. You better straighten up, right? That's the message of the prophets. You better straighten up. You have sinned. The people, the kings, the priests, whoever it is, you have sinned and you need to straighten up and repent and turn around. And if you don't, guess what's going to happen? Judgment. Judgment will happen. And then we know that it did looking back on history. Okay, so as we look at that, 
I'm going to jump forward a little bit, and here are a couple of Bible verses from the New Testament. Let's look first at Luke chapter 7, verse 16. This is a Bible verse that happened after Jesus raised a widow's son. In Luke chapter 7, it says, Fear seized them all. The, those who were watching, they seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great, what? A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Let's look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 is about the triumphal entry of Jesus. On the Holy Week, we call it Palm Sunday, on the triumphal entry of Jesus. It says here that as Jesus was mowing along here, traveling along, the crowds gathered and they said, this is the, this is the prophet, Jesus. The prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Even in the, later on in the New Testament, you have Peter in Acts chapter 3, and you have Stephen in Acts chapter 7, who quote Deuteronomy 18. And the purpose of their quotation is to say to the Jews of the day, your prophet came to you and you rejected him. And what does the word of the Lord say when you reject the prophet that God was to send? You are to be judged, right? You're in big, big trouble. That's what is said. But essentially, uh, Peter says, you can still repent and turn around. But what happened was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. Okay, now let's wrap this up, okay? Let's wrap this up and bring this all to a, a head here. Jesus is the very word of God. The role of the prophet was to speak the very words of God, right? So Jesus came and he declared to the people the very words of God. And as we have here uh, the Bible and the New Testament and the words of Jesus, the teaching about Jesus, what we should understand is this is the very words of God, the words that Jesus spoke. And if this is, the this is the word of the Lord, if these are the words of Jesus himself, as the word breathed out, then what should we do with this? Should we neglect it? Should we abandon it? Should we forsake it? Should we think that there are more people who vote a different way and so the majority wins? Should we think, well, culture is starting to swing this way and we need to get with the times? Oh boy, what does Deuteronomy 18 say about that kind of thinking? About rejecting the prophet whom he has sent? There's big trouble for that person, right? To reject the word of the Lord and to reject this as if it doesn't matter or doesn't count? Um, dear friends, we need to be very, very careful that we would study diligently God's word and that we would love it and honor it and cherish it and that we would ask God to help us live it because in and of ourselves, we can't do it. That's why the high priest came to die for us, to mediate for us, but then ask God through his spirit to fill us and empower us so that we can live this word. So we should seek to learn what it says and we should obey his commands. I, I need to wrap up. I need to be done. Jesus is the perfect high priest and Jesus is the perfect prophet, right? So come to him. Come one and come all. If you are here this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died. He made the sacrifice as the high priest and he died. He was the sacrifice so that you can be forgiven and made right with God. Do not neglect our great high priest. Do not neglect the prophet that has come, but listen to him. He has the authority of God himself. And may we cherish Jesus Christ, not just prophet, priest, and king, but judge 
prophet, priest, and king, right? May God bless his word. Let's bow our heads and pray. Ask the worship team to come forward, okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, as we think upon Jesus and how he filled these roles perfectly, uh, I pray that our hearts would be made low and we would stand in awe that there was a, a picture in the Old Testament that there were demonstrations that all point to Jesus Christ, that lead us to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would press upon us uh, a knowledge of the truth that Jesus is the fulfillment, the great high priest, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophet, the one to come. May we give our lives to him. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for loving us so much. Help us to follow you in all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. It's a joy to be able to worship Jesus Christ and pray that our hearts are encouraged by what he has done for us. Let me leave you with Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. Pray you have a great week and walk in the knowledge and truth of Jesus Christ. We'll be heading out on vacation, so I won't see you for a couple of weeks, but I will dearly miss you. Have a great day. God bless.